Hey, good morning. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. All right, so we're uh, in the middle of our series uh, on the book of Romans. And so we're journeying through the book. Um, we won't land in every chapter, but we're going to stop in various places that, uh, that, we, that we sense are, are important spots to just recognize in the book and to, to go through it. So um, the invitation, again, is, is, is out there for all of us. Um, read through the book of Romans. Uh, read it few, through a few times. In your week, if you read uh, about three to four verses a day, you'll get through the book in about five days to six days. Um, and at the same time, if you just get yourself familiar with it, uh, it helps uh, maybe in, your, in the sermon series as you go through and listen with us. Uh, we will end probably at the end of June, uh, mid-June or so, uh, where we're taking this series. So we're in Romans chapter 5 uh, today, and this is our, our spot. Um, and the big thing about this one is about really what's called justification, Justification by faith. This is a big Christian principle that we believe in here as a church, is that we are made right with God based solely on what Jesus has done, not based on what we have done. And so a lot of times we live in a culture today where we hope to be good people, and a lot of people live this life of just saying, if I'm a good person, maybe, just maybe I can get to God, or maybe I can get to heaven. And what the book of Romans reminds us completely is that it's, it's not based on uh, your standing on how good you are. It's based on the very fact that someone has already made a way for you and his name is Jesus. And so last week, if you weren't here, uh, you can always catch up on our sermon series on our website uh, and listen to it online. But last week we, let, we were in Romans 3 and we were talking about the righteousness of God. And, and today in chapter 5, uh, we're going to talk more about what are the benefits of being justified by faith. Now the word justification is, um, we talked about this a bit, let me just remind you. The word justification, it's a legal term. And this legal term is that uh, you and I are uh, people who are not perfect, and before an absolutely holy, righteous God, none of us can say uh, we are innocent because we have all fallen short. We've all done something or we have failed to do things that we're supposed to do. And so none of us, in, all, all of us in this room, we all can claim this one thing, we are not perfect. And when the judgment comes down from God, uh, justification means that God would look upon us and he looks upon us and he looks upon what Jesus Christ did on the cross through his death and resurrection and he bangs his gavel and he declares to each and every one of us who put our trust in Jesus, he says, you are innocent of all charges. And that's the amazing thing that we have in this thing called justification, is that we are made innocent. If we've put our faith in Jesus, we are made innocent of all charges that would ever be levied against us in the past, in the present, and in the future. And that's an amazing gift that God gives us. And so this blessing that we have on justification, it, it gives us life, it gives us meaning, it gives us purpose, it gives us life to the full as it's described in John chapter 10, 10. But it's more than I can imagine, more than I can really ever imagine. One of the things that um, I, I'd like to just maybe uh, turn your attention to is in Matthew uh, chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 verses 44 to 46 are, are two very short parables about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And so in these two very short parables in Matthew 13, uh, it opens up that the kingdom of God is this great treasure. 
And it's this great treasure that someone finds and he's willing to sell everything he has just to get it, just to own it, just to have it. So he finds a, a, fee, he finds a pearl and, and he, he wants to have it and, and it's this great treasure. So if you can read that parable, it's, two, it's three very quick verses uh, on the, the parable of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And so if I was to come to you today and just say to you, I, I have a proposition for you. Um, I, I have this ticket and this ticket guarantees you, pick the biggest number you want. 50, 60, 70 million dollars. I have this ticket for you. It's a 70 million dollar gift. What are you willing to do to get it? And when I put it that way, a lot of us, we will, you think of the lottery sometimes in that way, or you think about that, but I'm saying this is not a lottery. This is guaranteed. It's not by chance. It's guaranteed to you. This innumerable gift is guaranteed to you $100 million. What are you willing to do to have it? Would you sell me your car in exchange for this ticket? Would you sell me your home in exchange for this ticket? Would you sell me a kidney in exchange for this ticket? Would you sell me your firstborn in exchange for this ticket? What would you be willing to give for this? And the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is seen in the same picture. What are you willing to give up in order to receive this immeasurable gift? And, and so here we have, um, I, I'm constantly reminded of this wrestler back in the 80s and 90s called Ted DiBiase, the million dollar man. And his tagline was, everybody's got a price. Ted DiBiase actually became a, 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 a Christian and he actually goes on speaking. He wrestles and he, does, he, he shares his testimony at, at small town wrestling shows. But he says, everybody has a price. What are you willing to give? And for some of us, we're willing to give everything to follow Jesus. We're willing to give everything about who we are and what we believe in to follow Jesus. Some of us, we struggle with that. We're, we struggle to give our bank account over to Jesus. We struggle to give our reputation over to Jesus. We struggle to give our status over to Jesus. We struggle to give our, our spouse and our relationships over to Jesus. And it's this amazing gift that we've been given, and sometimes we hold on to things that maybe are not as valuable in the kingdom. C.S. Lewis writes it this way. He, 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 he gives this image of, of a child in the slums who plays with mud pies and is completely satisfied playing in the mud because they have no concept of a cruise ship. How many of you guys have been on cruises? Right? They have no concept of something even greater. And we are often like children um, who are in the slums who have no concept of something so great that we're easily satisfied playing with dirt. And so I don't want to boil this down. And I want to caution us today as we go through this chapter. I don't want to boil this down into a transactional um, image or a commodity image. I don't want to do that because I, I think we, we do a disservice to who God is and what he's about. But I want to show you the amazing blessings and riches that we have in Christ these amazing blessings and riches that we have in Christ, the things that, that often we don't recognize because we have been too easily satisfied with things that are not as important. And so if you have your Bible, um, I want to invite you to uh, open it up or turn it on, and we're going to be in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, which Chung uh, just read for us uh, to Ariel's dismay this morning. So Romans chapter 5, verse 1, starts off with this. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith. So there it is, the word justified. We have been justified, and it's how? Not by what you do, it is simply by faith in Jesus. Right? And so we have been justified by faith, and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And let's stop there. That's the first thing. The first thing that we get, the first blessing we get in this thing called justification, is that we have peace with God. God declares us to be righteous. We are no longer at odds with God. We stand before him, like I said in that image, we stand before him innocent of all charges, and he sees us as right people. He doesn't see us as us, though. He sees us covered in Jesus who made us all right in front of God. And so we have peace with God. We are no longer at odds with God. If we have put our faith in this justification that Jesus Christ did it all, we have peace 
with God. We are no longer an enemy of God. We stand before him innocent. And again, it's not because of anything we've done, but because Jesus covers us. All the barriers between us and God have been completely removed. If you go back to the beginning in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, this is when everything fell apart. This is where the whole world fell apart, is when sin entered the world through the disobedience of Adam and Eve. And it's from there that we have had this separation from God. And what did that, that entire chapter tell us about what this thing called separation of God looks like? It's words like this, sin, shame, guilt, fear, blame, death, and separation. We, this is what sin does to us. It, it causes separation. It causes breakdowns. It causes um, fear. It causes shame and guilt. And that's what sin does. And what we have been given now is peace with God. And we have everything other than those things now at our disposal. We have peace with God, which is the opposite of all those things that sin does. And now what do we have? We have holiness. We have righteousness. We have freedom. We have relationship. We have life. We have strength. We have courage. And that all those sin issues have now been taken care of and we no longer have to hold on to that. We hold on to all these other th attributes of holiness, righteousness, freedom, relationship, life, strength, and courage. And we have peace with God. Peace with God. We are no longer at odds with him. And so that's the first thing our justification gives us. Is that this blessing is that you and I have peace with God Almighty. And we can enter his presence innocent, righteous, holy, pleasing, and free. If you continue on then, the second thing uh, that we have with this justification is in verse 2, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And it's this idea of access. One of the amazing things now about our justification is that we have access. Now, at this church, uh, one of the ways that we can restrict your access is by keys, right? Now, if you don't have the keys, you don't have the access. And so we have these little amazing cards, and you tap them. I don't even know how it works, but I have this card, and I, I tap, and it opens another door, and I can tap, and it opens another door. And, and sometimes people come to me, you know, Pastor Ken, I need access. Can I get your key, right? Um, one time in, in one of the churches I served at, I had gone to uh, the office, I tapped my, my keys, put them down on my desk, and I was like, oh, I need to get youth group ready. And so I went to the stairs, um, they didn't have an elevator, the offices were on basement one, and I, went, I go to the stairs and I go up basement one to the ground level to the, first, to the second floor to the third floor where the youth room was. And I get to the top floor of the stairwell, and it's locked. And I'm like, oh, I don't have access. I'm a pastor, still don't have access. So I'm like, okay, so I go all the way back down to my office level to B1, and it's locked. And my keys are in my office. I don't have access. I go to the ground level, guess what? Locked. First, second level, locked. I was locked in the stairwell of a church. The only way out was the emergency exit that says, if you open this door, alarm will sound. So I opened the door so the alarm sounded, um, and I had to walk all the way around, hang my head in shame, ring the doorbell because I didn't have access. Ring the doorbell, wait for the secretary to look at the camera and say, what do you want? And I'm like, it's me, Pastor Ken. And he's like, oh, okay, and he opens the door for me. Access. You and I have been given access to God. That's the amazing thing about our justification. You and I have direct access to God. He says that by your justification, by faith, you now have access to the God Almighty. You know, one of the things that I think gets confused, and maybe if you grew up Roman Catholic, is that you have the priest that you have to go to before you can go to God. And the theology behind that is very different, but this tells us that we have direct access to God. You and I can go directly to God. You don't have to go through a pastor. You don't have to go through a deacon. You don't have to go through a small group leader. You don't have to go through anyone. You can go right to God. We have that access. When Christ died on the cross, there was an image that was given in one of the Gospels that said the veil of the, 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 the temple, the veil was torn 
because that symbolized there was a restrictive access to God at that point. It was only for the high priest to be able to access that room. And when Christ died, he tore that and said, no, it's going to be for everyone to access God if we put our faith in Jesus. And what that means is that we don't have to be ashamed to enter the presence of God. We don't have to feel guilty to enter the presence of God. And God's holiness will not destroy us because he says you have peace with me and you have access to me. He is now a place of safety and of refuge and we have direct access to him and we can go to God without absolutely any hindrance. That's an amazing gift that we've been given. A lot of times when you go through your insurance when you're trying to claim physiotherapy or chiropractic, right? You got to read through all the fine print and what are the benefits that I really have and how often can I buy glasses or how often can I go to the dentist, right? This is the fine print that we're given. Imagine this, you have peace with God and now you have access directly to God. You don't have to go through anyone else. You don't have to go anywhere else. We can go straight to God. Verse two continues uh, with this um, notion uh, Though we have act through uh, whom we have ac- gained access by faith in this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And I love this word to boast in the hope of the glory of God. In Christ, when we are justified because of Christ, we share in God's glory. Our, our sermon series on shame, one of the things that we talked about heavily about shame, one of the remedies of shame is glory and honor. And a lot of us uh, need to recapture what it means for us to have glory and honor uh, in our lives. But it's not about boasting about who we are. It's because Christ gives us honor. He gives us glory. Uh, It's probably illustrated this way. How many of you guys have gone to a high school where someone famous went there? What, What, who's the famous person? Yeah. Fail. Okay. Yeah. Steph Curry went to your high school, your middle school. If you don't know who Steph Curry is, he's a basketball player, one of the best right now. So, so, so um, Helene, as part of your glory, you get this glory of, I went to high school, I went to middle school with Steph Curry, and your middle school gets the glory as well, right? They post a picture and they go, hey, we had Steph Curry come to our school. Uh, Jason Spezza went to my school, hockey player. Uh, Jonathan Tavares went to uh, Clarkson Secondary School. So if you're in Mississauga, hey, he's from Mississauga. And we're like, yeah. And then we have Mike Myers from Scarborough and Jim Carrey. And if you're from Vancouver, maybe Ryan Reynolds, I don't know, whatever, right? We do this, don't we? We do this. We, We have a sense of when a celebrity goes to from the same city as you, we kind of, we share in their glory. If you go to Brantford, it's Gretzky, right? Bobby Orr lives in Mississauga. And, you know, so we have these things in our head. And this is the same illustration is that we have glory. We have the glory because we are now with Christ. And we share in that same glory that God has given him. And that's for us to share, to, to bask in, to be a part of, to live through. We are family with God. And God is the greatest at everything. He's, he's better than Steph Curry at basketball. He's better than John Tavares at hockey. He, he's better than anyone for anything. He's the creator of the world. And we get to bask in that glory. And we say, hey, we're part of that glory. This church is part of God's glory. This church is part of God's glory in Mississauga. And we're a part of that story and we're a part of that narrative. So we have hope in the glory of God. And our hope and glory is, is, is something that we can't boast in because it's really, you know, I didn't play basketball. I didn't coach Steph Curry. I, I didn't play hockey with Tavera. Like, I, I, none of these things are mine, but, but we get to bask in it because it's God's. And, you know, like I said this past week, uh, when I was sharing with some of the pastors saying, we need some people to help from your church, and they would ask, you know, you know how, how did you get this can to be 500? We're, 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 how did you do that? I said, honestly, I don't know, because it's really God's. He goes, oh, Ken, you must be doing a great job at your church. And I, you know what? That's God's glory. And I'm going to say, that's God's glory. Church, we're doing great because it's God's glory. We're just, we're just on board uh, with his glory. We get to bask in it, right? And so we have this hope in the glory of God. Uh, so we have, we have peace with God. We have access to God. We have the hope of his glory. Uh, the next thing is in verses um, four, sorry, three and four. And it says this. Not only so, but we also glory. I love that word, glory. 
in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You know, I think what Paul does, he's acutely aware of something. Paul is acutely aware when he writes this letter, he's acutely aware that life is complex. And as life is complex, there is pain and there is joy. And I think the one thing that we have done a disservice, if we believe Christianity is about a pain-free existence, it's about comfort, it's about having things uh, easy, we are sadly mistaken. Christianity has nothing to do with that. In fact, we will endure suffering. We will endure pain. Christianity is not about a trouble-free life. It is the fact that I, have, I understand a purpose beyond trouble. And so Paul writes that you will have difficulties, we will have uh, suffering, and so we don't rejoice for our suffering. It's not like, hey guys, I'm so excited, I've got cancer. No, we're not saying that. We rejoice in our suffering, not for our suffering, but there is joy still in the midst of trouble. There's joy in what we know as the aftermath. There's joy in what we know as a greater purpose uh, to these struggles. Tim Keller, who is a pastor in New York, uh, also a great theologian of our time, he says suffering has this chain reaction. I want to quote him on a couple of things here. Suffering's chain reaction, he says it this way, suffering leads to perseverance, which is what Paul writes. What does that mean? And so he says, suffering, uh, perseverance is the idea of being single-minded. You are going to be hyper-focused. And, and what suffering does is it hyper-focuses you to what is really important. After growing up, one of the things that my parents would always remind me is that money is not that important because money can't buy you health, right? Money can't buy you health. And so if, if health is of importance, well, all the money in the world can't really buy that for you. And so stick to what's important. Focus on what's important. If it's not money, it's got to be something else, right? And so you would hyper-focus in on what is really important. So that's what, that's what perseverance kind of really means at the core of it. Perseverance leads to character. Character is the idea of being tested or testedness. It's the quality of confidence that comes through your experience. It's like saying, I'm going to buy this tent from Canadian Tire. And if you've ever paid attention to the advertisement on Canadian Tire, one of the great things they have in the top right corner, it says, tested in Canada. So if you go camping and you want to make sure you have a good tent, we've tested this tent in Canada. So it can withstand snow and rain and sleet and minus 40 degree weather, which you're waiting for it to still pass, right? It's the idea of character is this idea of testedness. It comes from following and doing your duty despite it all. So the idea is that perseverance leads us to focus, and focus leads us to the quality of our confidence because we have been and have gone through the test. And hope, then, is what comes out of it all. Hope is this idea. Hope removes. It removes pseudo um, sources of our confidence because what it does, it drives us to the one place that you will find hope. See, a lot of us have pseudo-hope. Some of us, we, you know, hopefully tomorrow will be a better day. Hopefully, right, something. Hope this, hope that. Suffering drives us to focus, to be tested, and to put our confidence in the actual thing that actually provides hope, which is God himself. I mean, the people who are hoping right now in Ottawa that the water doesn't overflow into their homes... That's a hope, but if you put your hope in God, it's so much greater and deeper and richer than anything you could ever imagine. And so what suffering ends up doing, it drives us to focus on what's the most important thing? God himself. And you know, those of us who've ever gone through trials, those of us who've ever gone through um, challenges, we, we recognize and we see and understand more about this great God who has been in the background all this time working, working, and the coincidences and the things that happen. And, and we come out on the other side more prepared, more aware, uh, 
more understanding of this greater plan that God has. And so we have this idea of perseverance and character and hope as a result of these benefits. The next thing then after that is in verse 5. He continues on with this. And hope does not put us to shame uh, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And this is the one amazing thing about these benefits is that we have the assurance of God's love. God's love was declared and shown to us. It was poured out to us by the Holy Spirit. And the act of God's love was simply this, that Christ died for the ungodly. In verses 6 through 8, and we've had that read in our worship time, we had that read during our scripture time. Read verses 6 to 8 again, and just let that soak in. Just hear it again. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's an amazing thing, just to just hear that again. Christ died for the ungodly. Who is that? That's you and me. That's every one of us here and beyond here. That Christ died for us. And he said, not after you cleaned up yourself. He didn't say, okay, go clean yourself up, then come to me. Go fix your relationship, then come to me. Go sort out your mess, then come to me. He didn't say that. He said, while you were still this way, Christ died for us as the ultimate expression of God's love. While we were still messed up. That is what we received. God's love that way. Not in a way that said, clean up your mess. Not in a way that said, get it together. In a way that said, while you were still this way, Christ would die for us. And this is the challenge now with that. That if this is how God demonstrates his love for us, when he says to us, go and love others, man, that's hard. Because our love for others, we tend to put parameters around it. What will you give me back in return? But see, Christ came and he said, I loved the unlovable. You and I. And that same love is for those of us who we consider unlovable. Maybe it is your enemy. Maybe it is a broken relationship. Maybe it is someone of a different race, ethnicity. Maybe it is someone of a different socioeconomic class. Maybe it is all those people who don't look like you, don't talk like you, don't smell like you, don't live a lifestyle like you. He says that while I died for you, your love, my love, is to be spread to other people who are just as unlovable as I am. Church, our expression of love is supposed to follow God's expression of love. God's method was greater. It's easy for us to love people that we like. God didn't like us to begin with. (laughs) But he said, I'll make a way. So we need to reconsider, church, how we love each other, how we love those who aren't here whether you're black, white, brown, First Nations, whether you're upper class, middle class, lower class, welfare, whether you're white collar or blue collar, whether you're straight, gay, bi, lesbian, homosexual, Q, T, whatever else there is out there, God says, how will you love those unlovables? And that's what we've been about, church, for this last so many years, is to keep figuring that piece out. How do we love the unlovables? The assurance of God's love has been given to us. The greatest thing then at the end of all this is in verses 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10 says this, We have now been justified by his blood. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. He uses this great big word, reconciled. What does that mean? It means a relationship that is completely restored. I think of sometimes as friendships um, come and go and, and friendships that break down, uh, a lot of times you'll, you can have a good friend and all of a sudden something happens and, and maybe the, the relationship gets broken down 
and, and you no longer talk to each other, you no longer text each other, you just don't want to see each other. And then someone in that relationship says, you know what, we need to make this right. And, and you restore the relationship, you work at it, you, you, you point out maybe where the, the hurt was and where the errors were, and, and you forgive, and you come back together, and that relationship is now restored. Happens all the times in marriages where you've argued with your spouse and, and you know, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry too. Well, you should be sorry. You know, like, <laughs> that kind of stuff, right? And, 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 but you're still, you're still going to move on together as husband and wife. And God says, you know, um, you were once at odds with me and, and I, you, you didn't even know it. You've offended me and you didn't even know it. Have you ever had a friendship where you offended someone but you didn't even know it? And you wondered why they stopped talking to you and you had no clue. And God says, you, you know, you've offended me, but you don't even know it. But you know what? I'm not going to wait for you uh, to figure it out. I'm going to come to you in my son, Jesus Christ, to die and make a way and give you access to me, give you peace with me, give you my love. And now that relationship is fully restored to the way it's supposed to be. And that's what God did for us. And these are all the benefits of our justification. So I'm going to close with this, and worship team, you can come on up and, and get yourselves ready here to, to lead us in response. All, all of these things are about what God has done. And these are the, this is like our insurance. It's, it's, these are the benefits we receive if we put our faith and trust in Jesus. And so I want to invite you today, if this is you, and, and just if you're in any of these categories, I, I just want to give you an opportunity to, to have action. For some of us here, we have not put our, our full trust in Jesus Christ. And so we don't share in this justification language. We don't share in the fact that we have access to God, that we have peace with God. And some of us are still trying to, trying to work ourselves out, trying to say, if I was just a better person, maybe God would accept me, or maybe the church would accept me. Or if I just do these things right, then maybe God would look kindly upon me. Um, and I'm going to say to you, stop jumping on that wheel. And in fact, get off that wheel and just simply put your trust in Jesus, that he died on the cross for your sin and he rose again after three days. Now, if that's you today, I want to invite you to take an action step during our singing time or after service. You can go to that banner there. It's called Next Steps. Uh, Chung, who read our scripture there for us this morning, uh, he'll be there or, or one of the pastors will be there. And you just need to tell us what's going on and we'll pray for you and we'll talk you through it. If that's you today, I don't want you to leave this place without at least considering putting your trust in Jesus today, completely. For some of us, um, we have this relationship with Jesus. And so if that's the case, I want you to today, your action step is to go back on this and look at this and allow the expression of all that God blesses you with to really take root in your heart. To look at what it means to have peace with God. To look at what it means to have the assurance of God's love. And for some of us, it's, it's about renewing our commitment to God today. And so if that's you, I want to give you that opportunity. Again, you can go to the Next Steps table as well and just say, I'm just here, to, I just want to recommit, just pray with me. I just want to recommit where I am with God. And if you're okay with all this and you love this message and you love what God has given you, and you value it and you treasure it, like he says in Matthew 13, that you value it and you treasure it. May I remind you this, it's not for you to keep. So this week, would you keep your eyes open for someone that God will put in your life that needs to hear this same good news, this same gospel, that we have peace with God, access to God, that we are reconciled with God, that we have the assurance of God's love. If that's you today, just, I, I, we're going to just pray, but I want you to pray that God would show you someone to share that message of hope today because the world needs that message. And we would be far too selfish to keep it to ourselves. So again, if you need to make a commitment to Jesus today, I'm going to invite you to go um, during our singing time. If you needed to make a recommitment to Jesus, I'm going to invite you to go uh, during our singing time. And if not, if you're just committed to all this, keep your eyes open this week because God's going to put someone in your life to share this message of hope. Let's pray together. God, Holy Spirit, we invite you to um, move uh, in your people today. I want to pray for those who need to trust you entirely with Jesus. 
Lord, Spirit, move in their life. Show them, give them courage to make that decision today. And those of us who need to recommit, again, give us, give us that courage to make that decision today. To tell someone to, to work that out. And God, we want to pray in advanced faith uh, that you will bring into our life someone who needs to hear the message of hope, the message of the good news of Jesus in our workplace, in our school, in our families, in our neighborhoods, wherever that may be. God, we would just be sensitive to your spirit today, this week to share that message of hope. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.